morning. Welcome to a beautiful day in the house of God. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, I want to welcome you. My name is Brad. I have the privilege of serving as one of your pastors. And uh, the scriptures say words like, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And I wonder today, have you had an opportunity to look up at the sky yet? Uh, and consider the greatness and the wonder and the majesty of God. Last week, Terry brought us a wonderful message about the presence of God in creation, and that is on full display this weekend. And so, thank you. There are a hundred million places you could be right now, but you're choosing to spend this time worshiping the God who created it all. And so, we're so glad that you're with us. Uh, we want to connect with you further, whether you're with us most of the time or whether this may be the first time you're joining us in person or online. Uh, and the easiest way and the best way right now for us to do that is digitally, to provide you some more opportunities to plug into the life of the church beyond just worship. And so if you're streaming online, our online host, Renee Watson, is providing that information to you now. If you're here in person in the room, you can use our church app to go to that connection card, or you can go online and give us enough information that you're interested and comfortable in giving us, and we would love to connect with you and plug you in to the various ways that you can be involved in growing and serving and coming to know God better through the life of the church. Uh, we're going to have a fantastic worship service over the course of the next hour. We will sing together. We will have the privilege of being a part of a baptism. We will open the scripture together. We will pray. And we will continue in this series called Unblinded Faith, where we are looking at uh, the things that provide a solid foundation in this thing that we called faith. And so we're glad that you're here to be a part of that. One quick thing in terms of announcements, along with the other opportunities that we have through worship and growth and service, we do believe that God can grow and shape us and transform our whole lives as people. And part of that also involves the part of our life that is our finances and uh, our financial house. And one opportunity we have that we're so excited to sort of roll out is free financial coaching. And this is, follows along with a model of Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. But we have a free opportunity for you to go through some personalized, specific to your situation, financial coaching from people that have been trained in doing that. And they are wanting to give of their time as a service as a, and as an offering so that your finances can be a blessing and not a burden. And so if that interests you and you'd like more information, our Minister of Administration, Renee Watson, who is hosting this morning online, uh, is available to get more information and give, uh, steer you in the right path for that. We hope you'll take advantage of that so that we can all be a blessing and that part of our life won't be a burden. That's not how God intended it. And so uh, it's great to be in worship. One of the ways that we often begin this time together as a way of coming together, both in the room and at home, and we invite you at home to uh, either remain sitting room and
this time, I'd like to invite the Milligan family to come forward. Uh, parents are Lee and Cam, and they are bringing their daughter Meadow for baptism. For those of you that might not know, baptism is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. It marks initiation into uh, Christ's holy church and the discipleship process. And Meadow, you look like you're studying us pretty astutely there. We're okay. We've done this before. <laughs> A little bit earlier, I saw that you were flirting, so (laughs) you guys are welcome to come up here and stand so that everybody can face, uh, everybody can see y'all as y'all face them. Uh, Cam, you can come up and stand up here too. Uh, On behalf of the entire church, I need to ask y'all some very important questions uh, before we baptize Meadow. On behalf of the whole church, do you reject, renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world? and repent of your sin. If you do, please say, I do. And do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppressions in whatever forms they present themselves? If you do, please say, I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with Christ's church, which Christ has opened to all people of ages, nations, and races? If you do, please say, I do. Cam and Lee, will you nurture Meadow in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Brothers and sisters in the congregation, we have a question for you as well. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Meadow, the vision that your parents have for your life is that you would live a Christ-centered life that's focused on love, learning, and serving others, and to make a positive impact on this earth. What's Meadow's middle name? Meadow James Lee. Meadow James Lee, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the act of baptism, and we thank you for the symbol that it reminds us of, of your love. We thank you for your love for Meadow, even though she might not be aware of it yet, that through demonstrations, through her parents, her family, this church family, the nursery, the children's ministry, that she will one day accept for herself the love of Jesus Christ by trusting in him as Savior and Lord. We pray that you would grow her in the spirit so that one day she will be described as a woman after your own heart. For this we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen, amen. So brothers and sisters, part of the congregation, baptism does not happen in isolation, but instead in the midst of the gathered community of faith. And so members of the household of God, I commend today, Meadow, to your love and your care. Please do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. And you have a response as well, and so I invite you to follow up and read with me that response. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, would you welcome them as they are being seated and congratulate Meadow on her baptism this morning as they are being seated. Thank you. I tease some of you guys and say, one of these days we're going to get ready to get rid of these, and there's going to be so much happy dancing happening through the streets. That's all I know. Amen? Amen. All right. As we continue in worship this morning, we continue with our opportunity to give back to God. We give to God through our gifts, our tithe, and our offering.
And so there are many ways that are offered to you. You can give online. You can text AFUMC to 77977. And then there's also the giving boxes as you depart from the sanctuary. However you choose to give, we are grateful for your faithfulness and your generosity. One of the ways we have seen generosity in action is if you noticed as you pulled into the parking lot, there is a big, um, a big trailer and it is collecting um, supplies for dream weavers and it is collecting clothes, household items, things like that. Well, I'll have you know that this is the second time we're filling it up. Last week it was filled up, it was taken, it was delivered and now we are filling it up again. All of that is due to the faithfulness of you. And for that, we are so grateful. It makes a difference in lives, everybody. Thank you. Let's pray together. Gracious, everlasting creator God, we come before you this moment with hearts filled with love and adoration. You alone are worthy of worship, honor, and praise, because you alone are God. You are God in the good times, and you are God in the hard times. You know our beginnings and our ends. You know our challenges, and you know our celebrations. You are always with us, leading us, guiding us, showing us the way. In you, we can place our hope and our trust. You are faithful. Your love and your mercies are unending. For those who are facing life challenges this morning, whether those challenges come in the form of health or relationships or finances, in whatever form they take, Lord God, we offer to you those challenges. We offer to you the season of life that creates strain, knowing that you are the perfect one to turn to because we know, as the psalmist wrote, that weeping may endure for the night, but joy still comes in the morning. Help each one of us to hold on to you as we face challenges. For those who celebrate today, for those whose prayers have been answered, their journey is filled with abundance, we praise you knowing every good thing flows from you. Let us all, no matter what season of life we are in, let us all who have breath praise you, O Lord. Praise you for this day. Praise you for your love. Praise you for the millions of ways you move in our lives and we are unaware. We praise you. And we join our voices together as we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh. 
How are you, church? You good? Some of you are, and uh, I think a few of you might even be smiling behind those masks. It's kind of hard to tell. I think some of y'all wanted to applaud for the choir, uh, but maybe got cut off, so let's just go ahead and do it anyway. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that was quite as voluntary as we're used to when it comes to applauding for the anthem, but thank you so much. Hey, it's great to be with you guys uh, as we are in week three of our series, Unblinded Faith. For those of you that are of faith and that you would consider yourself to be a person of faith in Jesus Christ, this series is designed to give you the confidence to know that your, your, your faith does not have to be a blind one. You can take confidence, you can have assurance in the things that you believe, and more importantly, in the witness that you have in this world. Now, we also want to say that if you're a person who is questioning faith, maybe you're a person who's skeptical about things, maybe you're even a little antagonistic and you're tuning in today online, maybe you're here in the room, we want you to know that you're certainly welcome here. Uh, we are having a conversation that you get to be privy to, and our hope and our prayer is that this would be a blessing to you as well. In fact, we've gotten testimony from family members and from friends who have tuned in during this series with folks that are maybe considered atheists or those that are skeptical, and they are finding that this series has been beneficial to them. One of the things that we're going to talk about today where you can have confidence and assurance is the Bible as a source of truth for your life. Uh, truth is one of those terms that is uh, quickly kind of eroding and becoming a little bit more subjective, and maybe that's perhaps because we've uh, become really comfortable with this term fake news. It seems to be kind of a, a new term that's been used, at least in my lifespan, 
but maybe not so much generationally. I want to do a pop quiz with you this morning, a presidential pop quiz. I know that's exactly what you woke up thinking you wanted to get at church, a presidential pop quiz. I'm going to read you a quote, and then after that quote, I'm going to count to three. On the count of three, I want you to say which former president you think said this quote. So this is a former president who said, there has been more news errors propagated by the press in the last 10 years than in the 100 years before that. So on the count of three, you yell out which former president you think said that. One, two, three. Okay. I I could actually discern it at the 11 o'clock, and and it sounded like the overwhelming majority of folks said Donald Trump. If you said Donald Trump, you are wrong. Actually, President John Adams said this in 1778. He said there has been more news error propagated in the press in the last 10 years than in the 100 years before 19 or 1778. That's pretty wild that he said that. Uh, you could have known that it was one, not one of our current presidents because the word propagated was used in that. And that might be a little <laughs> too difficult. Okay, anyway. <laughs> With the The advent of what we call fake news, er erroneous news, uh, there's no doubt that it can be hard to discern what is truth, what is fact, and what is either fake or an error. I mean, you can go on social media and you can find all kinds of articles that are posted. Sometimes there's a fact check alert or a false alert on those to let you know that that might not be true. You can go to fact checkers when you read something that's incorrect. I've had to call my mom and be like, mom, that's not true. Take it off your Facebook post. <laughs> you could go and, and look at uh, one journalistic publication and maybe get two different headlines. In fact, I brought you an example. This was just from about six years ago, where Wall Street Journal on the same day produced two different headlines for the same picture and for almost the same article. Now, to their credit, the reason that they claim that there's a different headline is that when the first one was published, it was a different time, that's where the circle is, than the second one that was published. But nevertheless, both of those papers were mailed to different demographics, geographically, and at different times, And if people only read headlines, which most men only do, by the way, you could have two different contexts for the same story. Interesting. Now we've got to contend with the deep fakes. Do y'all know what deep fakes are? Is that animators and people that produce video are so good that they can produce realistic pictures and videos that we think is real, but in actuality, it's been made up and fabricated. This is the challenge that we have when it comes to discerning what's true, what's not, what maybe is in print before us. Can we trust it? Well, I've got good news for you today, and that's why you showed up here at church is to get good news, amen? The good news for you today is that when it comes to our faith in God, our faith in Jesus Christ, we have a reliable and trustworthy source It's called the Bible, and I want to share how we can come to trust it, how we can count it as reliable for us as a source of understanding God and the practice of our faith. There are three tests that you can do to prove authenticity, reliability, and trustworthiness, and the first one is the honesty test. The honesty test is when you have reason to believe that the author and the writer has character specifically for accuracy, and I want to share with you three scripture passages just to Help us out with that this morning. If you brought your Bibles, you've got a Bible app, I want to invite you to go with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. 2 Peter, obviously, it's a second letter that the Apostle Peter wrote to the church. And this is what he writes about their source of credibility and reliability in verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were what? eyewitnesses of his majesty. John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, another follower of Jesus Christ, an eyewitness to him, writes this, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and touched, this concerning the word of life. Did you notice all of the experiential ways that they encountered Jesus Christ? And then Luke the gospel writer at the beginning, verses 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, 
just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, or brothers in God, brothers and sisters in God, that you may have what? Certainty concerning the things you have been taught. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For my witnesses and eyewitnesses of eyewitnesses, we can trust the honesty of Scripture. They were people of good, good character once they encountered Jesus. And they were accurate in their writings. Evidence, eyewitnesses, and eyewitnesses of eyewitnesses. Uh, another way that we have evidence of the honesty test is through embarrassment. Have you ever noticed that most people don't post pictures on social media of embarrassing moments? Nor do we have a count of how many times it took to get that family portrait of Easter exactly right. I mean, Brad took our family's picture after the 11 o'clock, so it was a one, it was a one shot take. I mean, that's, that's the way we do it at our house. I don't know about you. But then we went home and Liz wanted to get pictures for the Christmas calendar that we give people for the next year. And she's already planning for, you know, 2022, if we can ever make it there, if Jesus doesn't return. So she had to get the April pictures, the Easter pictures, and we went outside. All I wanted to do was climb back into the tomb and take a nap. But we were outside for an hour to get those perfect pictures that are going to go on that calendar. People do not post or celebrate or write about their most embarrassing moments. But have you ever read the Bible? It's full of embarrassing moments. And that's one way that we can know that it's reliable and trustworthy for us. And the Old Testament is full of them. And then you got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you've got the disciples, and there were some really embarrassing moments, like James and John, their two brothers, and they're having a fight, a sibling fight, over who gets to sit next to Jesus. And then their mom gets involved, which is a little bit more embarrassing than just John and James getting in a fight. You know when mom has to call up? How about the fact that women were the first at the tomb? Now, we wouldn't say that that's embarrassing in any way, but... 2,000 years ago, as Terry reminded us on Easter morning, if you were to base a testimony off of a woman's account of the story, that would have been scandalous and certainly embarrassing. The disciples, when Jesus goes to pray in the garden, what do they do? They fall asleep. Jesus even kind of shames them a little bit. Not really, but he's like, could you not even stay awake for a moment? And then you've got Peter. And we could just leave it at that, Peter. Just say Peter. And we know that that's embarrassing. I mean, think about the fact that he stepped out of the boat to walk on water, which I think is an amazing feat of faith. And he walks a little bit, gets distracted by the wind and the waves, and he starts to sing and fall. And Jesus says, oh, you have little faith. Or how about the time that Jesus actually called him Satan? I mean, that's a pretty embarrassing moment, but yet it's included about his original followers. And then you have Peter, who lived with Jesus for three years. And then when he was crucified, he denied Christ three times, just as Christ told him. That he, what? he warned him, hey, you're going to die on me three times. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. And then he does. Embarrassing story. The embarrassment actually proves for people that criticize literature the authenticity of it, the reliability of it, the trustworthiness of it. The Bible passes the honesty test. It also passes the telephone test. Y'all remember the game telephone? Now for you young folks, I mean, y'all are so entertained by other things. Y'all didn't have to play games like this like we did when we were growing up, but we had to be creative when it came with our time. And the telephone test was where you would tell one person a message and then they would tell another person that same message and we'd pass it along. And we're going to do that with a choir. I don't know how many of you are here this morning. It might take a little bit, so just hang tight, okay? No, I'm just kidding. But you can imagine thousands of years of biblical history and certainly 2,000 years of Christian history. Can you trust and is it reliable that the message that was proclaimed then is the same message that we have now? And the answer is yes. And here's why. Because the way that you pass the telephone test is by having a small gap when it comes between the original events and when it's written and then the earliest manuscripts. And I brought you some historians that have not been in debate this morning. We're going to put them on the screen. Pliny, the elder, when his events took place and when his earliest manuscripts were found were 700 years removed from him. Josephus, a reliable Jewish historian, 800 years 
between the events in the earliest manuscript. Herodotus, 1,500 years. Now, here's what's cool. When it comes to the Bible, you can with certainty say the earliest was 40 years. Some would even say 25 years with references to a creed that was only two years old. All of it, when it comes to the New Testament, within 120 years. It passes the telephone test in that way. It also passes it in another way. The amount of original manuscripts that you're able to find. Daniel Wallace said that there's no doubt that it passes this test because there's more manuscripts than Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great that affirm the life and the ministry of Jesus. One of the greatest pieces of literature that you probably read in English growing up, maybe in your AP English class like I had to do, was Homer's Iliad. Anybody else have to read Homer's Iliad? All right. It had 1,757 original manuscripts found. The Bible has 23,000 for the New Testament alone. I might not be good at math, but I know that's a big difference. There's nothing like the Bible when it comes to its reliability and trustworthiness when it comes to the telephone test. It passes the telephone test, even though there are some differences. Now, over 80% of the differences that you might find in the accounts that are in the Bible, almost 80% of them are related to the way that you spell words. Now, you could spell the same word in different ways. I could spell honor one way. You could spell honor another way. I could spell theater one way. You could spell theater another way. I, I could say tomato. You can say tomato. I could say potato. You can say, you can say pecan and you'd be wrong because I say it's pecan. Even though my family's from the South, that's the way they say it. So you can spell things differently, the same word. You can say things differently, the same word. Over 80% of any of the differences that are found in all of the volume of manuscripts that we have are related to the differences in the way that you spell the same word. The majority of the other differences that are found throughout the manuscripts are that some would use a proper noun and others would use a pronoun. Not significant. Only 1%, less than 1% of the differences that are found in all of the manuscripts actually relate to anything significant. And most of those are noted in your scripture, like the end of Mark's gospel where you step on scorpions and tread among snakes and handle snakes. That was found in not the earliest, but some of the later manuscripts. Another one, John chapter 8, where a woman was caught in adultery. You'll notice in your Bible it'll say, this was not found in some of the earliest manuscripts. That's less than 1% of any of the differences. It passes the telephone test. And the last test to prove authenticity, reliability, trustworthiness of any ancient text is through the corroboration test. The corroboration test is when you look for outside sources to prove those things that are inside the source itself. And we've got a number of those sources as well. Historians, we mentioned this on Easter, historians that will account to Jesus' life, the fact that he suffered, that he died, and that he came back from the dead, even though they themselves weren't there or would consider themselves a follower of Jesus Christ. Primarily, we have archaeology that is continually discovering more and new things. Even, in fact, uh, weeks at, before we started prepping for this, um, series, some more Dead Sea Scrolls that were uh, found to point to the authenticity of the Bible. I brought to you a picture that was recently found about four years ago. This is a ring uh, that indicates that Pontius Pilate was reigning when he said that he was reigning. I don't know if you can see it or you can read the ancient script that's on there, but yeah, that he reigned when he said he would reign, which was for some debatable until recent inscriptions on stone in that ring have been found to point to the reliability and the trustworthiness of Scripture. Other things that are being found that have dates that are pointed to the places in the Bible. Did you know in crucifixion, using nails for feet were questionable until the 1960s, but then there was a nail that was found through the heel, of, heel bone of an individual and also had the inscription of Johannine or John on it. Things are constantly being found. Like you remember the story of Samson in the Old Testament where he betrays God, he's captured, but then he's locked up. And the Bible says that he 
pushes two columns and an entire building falls down and it kills all of the Philistine army. Do you remember that story? Seems a little far-fetched that you could be able to do that. In fact, we're going to test this out right now. If you'll, if you'll take one of those columns. And they're actually discovering right now that there are buildings that are built with a base of two columns that if you were to push the columns, the entire structure would fall down. That, David and... Um, David and Goliath, Solomon's reign, all kinds of archaeological facts corroborating the story that this is true, that it's trustworthy, and that it's reliable. When you hear of fake news, I want you to remember the good news and that the good news is trustworthy, it's reliable. And here are three ways that it's trustworthy and reliable for you. It's trustworthy and it's reliable for you to understand God and for you to understand yourself better. And when you read through the pages of Scripture from the beginning to the end, it is clear that we have a great God who is also good. He's great in all of the alls, all of the alls, all powerful enough to create something out of nothing, all knowing, all present, eternal, never changing, sovereign, indirectly or directly in control of all things at all times. This is the great God that we have in this book. But he's also good, which is good news for us, because when we take a look at understanding ourselves through the pages of Scripture, what it tells us is that every person on this planet was created in the image and the likeness of God. That means that you have this worth and you have this value that you have in your creation. But it also says... They were all born into a nature of sin. Our nature is to rebel against God. And the goodness of God is seen most through his love and through his justice, found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That while we were at our worst, God's love was at its best. God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross for our sins. And those that place trust in Jesus as the forgiver of sins and the leader of their life have the promise of new, abundant, and eternal life. God's word, the Bible, it's trustworthy, it's reliable to guide us in life. I mean, this Bible is full of all kinds of commands and all kinds of precepts for our life. And sometimes they get in our way of having fun, let's just be honest. Sometimes those guidelines and those principles, they're, they're not necessarily the things that we want to be doing in life. But behind every precept, there is a principle for you to experience God's definition of a prosperous life. And behind every command that God gives you is a concern so that you won't either destroy your life and so that you can experience God's definition of an abundant life. We're told that scripture is God-breathed and is useful in teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. We're told through the Psalms, if you were with us in our Psalm series, that it is God's wisdom for us. It is a lamp for our feet, a light for our path. It is to guide us in this life so that we can experience all that God created for us to experience. And that's why God's word is to be treasured above all else. Because it's reliable and trustworthy, you should treasure it above all else. You notice the way that the authors of the Bible speak about God's law, God's word in its totality? They treasure it more than they treasure anything else, any other resource that they have. They say that it's sweeter than honey, it's more precious than gold, silver, or precious stone. That it is the standard by which we count all revelation and all interpretation. It is sufficient for everything that we need for salvation. And that it is wisdom for God's way for us to experience all that he created for us to experience. When you think of fake news, think of the good news. It's trustworthy, it's reliable, and it's God's way of helping us understand him, understand ourselves, to experience God's definition of a blessed life, and to be treasured above all else. I want to close with a story of an atheist named J. Warner Wallace. J. Warner Wallace was a cold case criminal um, attorney, not a criminal. He was a cold case attorney. He never lost a case. To my knowledge, he still hasn't lost a case. But he was an atheist until he was 35. 
He said every cold case that he ever represented on and then won the case, he said there were three common factors that any crime was committed because of one of three reasons. The first was a desire for sex or lust. The second was a desire for power. And the third was a desire for money. He said one of the things that helped him as he started studying the reliability and trustworthiness of our faith, as it came through scriptures, one of the things he noticed as he dug into the cold case of faith in Christ was that there were none of those themes that were found in scripture when it came to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Women were never, never objectified. In fact, through Jesus and through the Pauline letters, they were liberated in ways they had never been liberated before in history. There's a stricter framework for relationships in the way that intimacy is to be carried out than that of Moses. And Jesus even said, hey, before you go to the act, look at the heart. If you've committed it in your heart, then it's like you've done it in the real. There's not a desire for power from Jesus. You remember just Monday, Thursday, two weeks ago, where we were reminded that Jesus got down on his knees before his disciples and he washed their feet in only a way that a service did. There's no desire for power. In fact, it was a distribution of power and a way of saying, hey, I place you above me. And then ultimate, ultimate service was dying on the cross for the world. There's no desire for money. In fact, often Jesus challenged a person's desire to follow him by saying, hey, if you want to follow me, you got to give it all away. And not to him so that he could be a prosperous preacher, but to those that really needed it. And then ultimately he was buried in a tomb that had to be borrowed because there wasn't enough money from the ministry. Good news is that that borrowed tomb is empty. The better news is that cold case attorney gave his life to Jesus Christ. The best news for all of us is that this book is trustworthy and it's reliable enough to transform lives. So treasure it above all. It'll make the greatest difference in your life. Let's pray. God, we thank you that in the midst of chaos, uncertainty, and even fake news and deep fakes. That we can know truth. It's not subjective, it's objective in nature because it's truth from you. It's revealed to us through your written word called the Bible. God, we thank you that that's your recorded voice where you express yourself. You tell us what we really need and what's really needed in order for us to experience the fullness of life that you desire for us. We thank you ultimately for your living word, Jesus Christ, that he came and he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he came back from the dead so that our sin nature could be replaced with a spirit nature, that we could be forgiven of our sins, that we can have the assurance of a new, abundant, and eternal life. God, we would pray for any person in this room, any person joining in online today who has never before trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life, that today would be the day that the Bible calls a day of salvation where you begin the work of restoring their soul. I would pray for all who have come to that place of trusting Jesus as Lord and Savior. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you affirm what has been written in your word and what has been spoken today so that all of us can leave this place today with greater trust and greater faith, because you are trustworthy and you are reliable. For this we pray in Jesus' name. And all who agreed with this prayer said, amen. Would you stand as you're able and let's sing together our closing hymn.
Thank you for those of you that are in the room. I want to invite you to be seated for just a moment before our ushers come to dismiss us in a properly way. If you're joining us at home, you can do whatever you want to do right now. But one of the things that we would encourage all of you to do, if you found that this service and maybe this sermon has been helpful for you, it's likely that it might be helpful for others. Maybe to strengthen and encourage their faith, or maybe if you know somebody that's skeptical or maybe questioning and seeking faith, this might be helpful for them. We'd love for you to share this service with them. For those of you joining us online, uh, your host, Renee Watson, should be providing you a link to do that. For those of you that are in the room, you're going to have to do a little bit of work. Go home and grab the link and send that to somebody that it might make a difference for. Go out and make a difference in this world because we have a reliable and trustworthy God who expects us to and has filled us with his Holy Spirit to do just that. Be blessed, and we hope that you'll be back next week as we conclude our series on blinded faith. God bless you.